Now we're back to about 1540, and we're looking at a Renaissance painting that is actually a cartoon, that is, a story in one frame. It's by Michelangelo Anselmi, and it's the story of Apollo and Marcius. And the significance of the violin in this painting is that it, at the time, was considered to be the instrument of Apollo. And indeed, in this scene, he is shown playing it. It's actually an instrument that was called the viola da braccia. It uh, appears to be somewhat larger than a violin, but it's still uh, small enough to be held by the left arm of the player. And this is, among other things, a testament to the superiority of string music over other kinds of music. This is how the story goes. We start at the right side of the painting where we see the uh, goddess Diana represented, and she has been out in the woods hunting, and she comes across a bagpipe. And she thinks, oh, this is an interesting thing. I'm going to try playing this. But when she sees the reflection of herself in the water playing this bagpipe, she is horrified because she has to puff her cheeks and she looks terrible playing it. So she throws it down on the ground. And a little bit later, the demigod Marcius comes along in the same woods and he finds the bagpipe and picks it up and starts to play it. And he thinks this is the last word. This is such a great instrument. I'm going to challenge my rival Apollo to a duel. I'm going to play this instrument, he can play his violin, and I'm sure to win. So he challenges Apollo, and Apollo warns him. He says, do not do this. You are going to lose this contest. And when you do, your punishment is going to be terrible. But Marcius insists, so they have the contest, and the two are shown here playing their respective instruments. But of course, Apollo wins. After all, Apollo was a god and Marcius was only a demigod, and Apollo was playing a string instrument, and Marcius was playing the bagpipe, which is a wind instrument. Yes, indeed, Apollo wins, and on the left side, we see Marcius' punishment. He's being skinned alive. My Lord. And the moral of the story is, listen to and obey people in authority because if you don't, the punishment is terrible. And the fellow that leads the group is, is the fiddler. <laughs> the instruments depicted in this uh, painting, as you have bagpipes, Apollo is playing the viol de bracha, which in modern times is a tenor or an alto instrument known as the viola. In German, they call the viola a bracha, which means arm. And then if you look in the butches at the bottom of the painting, you have an actual viol that's probably a tenor or a soprano. So I don't know why there are differences there or why that in the, the viola de braccia is being played rather than the violin, but that's just my bias being a violinist, I think. What do we know about this painter? There are not very many of his works surviving. But he did tend quite often to paint scenes like this in response to commissions from people who wanted to teach a lesson through the symbols in the paintings. And it would seem at that period that most of those paintings, if you were to tell a story, it would be based on biblical stories. But he's reaching back to, he's reaching to Greek back, mythology. This he's is reaching a new back to ancient Greece. Yeah. Right. And this was, in fact, the fashion at his time in the Renaissance. Okay. Renaissance means rebirth, and in detail, it means rebirth of interest in things ancient from ancient Greece and ancient Rome. Even the morality tales of that time. Absolutely. It's also, uh, I think, uh, a depiction of stringed instruments in a pagan environment versus a more Christian or modern uh, religious environment. There's one other interesting point about depictions of Apollo and Orpheus 
from this period, the 1500s, the 1600s. In paintings like this one by Anselmi, these characters are shown playing the violin. But we all know that their instrument was the lyre. But we have to remember that in the 16th and 17th centuries, the only information that these people had from these ancient stories were the texts. And when they read the text in Greek or in Latin, it said Apollo played the lyra, or Orpheus played the lyra. But at that same time in Italy, the word for violin was lyra, and nobody knew anything about these sculptures that eventually were unearthed that showed these people playing lyres. So they assumed, ah, Apollo played the violin. Orpheus played the violin. I like the fact that Apollo in this painting also has his, uh, his quiver of arrows. Mm -hmm. So that, that idea of shooting the arrow into the deepest part of your psyche and the fiddle having this ability to seem to do that, to reach into your most intimate places, either joyfully or with great sadness. I nice just painting. wonder why Apollo chose the viola rather than the violin. Had it evolved at that point? Well, yeah, they had... Uh, well, oh, you mean the size of instrument? Uh, yeah, you can obviously tell if you look at the violin that's hidden in the bushes, it's much smaller. If you look at the upper bout, it's much smaller than the instrument that Apollo is holding. And therefore, why did he choose that? The darker sounding instrument over the higher pitched instrument. Just a curiosity. And there is a, a detail of this story that I didn't mention, and maybe it does have something to do with the choice of instrument that's shown with Apollo, and that is that another reason that Apollo won the contest was that with his instrument, he could sing and play at the same time. But Marcius could not, because he had to keep blowing to keep the bag full. I've thought about this, you know, the idea again, why does this shamanistic quality come with the violin? Is if it's really played well, it can be continuous sound. Now the bagpipe is almost one of the other instruments that can almost do that because you blow into it, but you can keep the sound constant and it has uh, a certain kind of seductive quality to it too because of that. Abner the eccentric, the great mime, said there's only three things we do in life. We breathe in, we breathe out, or we hold our breath. That's it. And he said the first thing you do when you're born is you breathe in, last thing you do is you breathe out. Something about a musical instrument that can be continuous, the tone can be continuous, without where other instruments you have to take a breath, you have to break it, mm -hmm. even a plucked instrument. You don't have that with a stringed instrument. You can maintain a constant pitch if you have the right bow technique. And that can, that can almost conjure up this yeah. other force. Mm -hmm. That's one of the things that we organists also lay claim to, ah. is the ability to produce a continuous legato sound without any trace of, of breathing as one of the special effects that we can produce with the instrument. So maybe that's why it has a godlike quality because as us mere mortals, we breathe in, we breathe out. There you go. Well, when, you, when you equate the length of the modern bow, it's uh, just as long as you could phrase singing a note or a phrase as your human lungs could do when you think about it. Very cool. Yeah. <laughs> well, nowadays, stuff. even the wind players are developing techniques to oh, yeah. make it seem like there's, they're not taking a breath. There's circular breathing, but yeah. there's a lot of snorting that goes on, and it's not particularly appetizing. 